Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. I'm Deborah Landau, director of NYU's Creative Writing Program. We are, we are thrilled to be hosting the National Book Award finalist reading at NYU for the first time. Thank you to the National Book Foundation for entrusting us with this honor. Warmest congratulations to all the finalists on this magnificent achievement. <laughs> on a personal note, uh, it's especially sweet to be hosting this year's reading at NYU because four of the 2022 finalists are NYU Creative Writing Program faculty or alums. <laughs> So it's lovely to be able to celebrate together. It's wonderful to be in a room together. This is a sold out house. It says a lot about community that we all want to, want to come out in such a cold rainy night and, and be together in a room. Immense gratitude to Gigi Dopico, our interim provost for her extraordinary support of tonight's event. And to everyone in the provost office at NYU, especially Ryan Pointer, and to Joanna Yaz in creative writing for orchestrating everything tonight so beautifully, so seamlessly. And um, to all our friends at the National Book Foundation, thank you. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Ruth Dickey, Executive Director of the National Book Foundation. Oh my goodness, good evening everyone and welcome to the 2022 National Book Award finalist reading. We are so thrilled that you're all here with us tonight. Thank you so much Deborah, for that introduction and thank you to the Office of the Provost at NYU Creative Writing Program team, especially Joanna Yaz, for helping make this special event possible. Thanks to, to the Dream Team staff of 10 at the National Book Foundation and especially our awards and honors manager, Madeline Shelton, and our friends at Really Useful Media for broadcasting both tonight's program and the awards tomorrow for readers everywhere. Tonight we're gathered the evening before the 73rd National Book Awards to celebrate the 2022 National Book Award finalists in person and online. Thank you all so much for joining us on this special occasion, and please join me in giving these incredible authors a huge round of applause. <laughs> this evening means a lot to us. It's a moment before the glitz and the glamour of the awards night to gather with the public, well, as many of you as we can cram into one room, and those of you joining us online, plus, um, to gather together for these authors' words brought to life on stage. We'll get to hear from every finalist text, meaning 25 titles, including excerpts from the translated literature finalists in both their original language and their English translations. Unfortunately, we're missing a few special voices who I'd love to speak into the room, and we are also gifted with a few special guests in their stead. Nicholas Elliott will be reading the original French on behalf of Scholastique Mukasonga, author of Kibogo. Idra Novi will be reading the original Spanish on behalf of Monica Ojeda, author of Jawbone. Fellow finalist Imani Perry will be reading on behalf of Gail Jones, author of The Birdcatcher. And finalist Margaret Mitsutani will be reading the original Japanese on behalf of Yoko Tawada, author of Scattered All Over the Earth, with Monique Trun, reading finalist Margaret Mitsutani's translation. We wouldn't be here tonight without the inspiring efforts of our 2022 National Book Awards judges who read 1,772 books submission, submitted this year and somehow, somehow narrowed that down to the 25 finalists in the categories of fiction, nonfiction, poetry, young people's literature, and translated literature. Those finalists represent some of the most remarkable work being published today, and what an honor it is to celebrate them. 
Tomorrow, we'll gather for the 73rd National Book Awards ceremony, which promises to be an incredibly special night, honoring Art Spiegelman and Tracy D. Hall, as well as this year's National Book Award winners. But the work that we do extends far beyond any one night, happening every day through our educational and public programming. Our goal is deceptively simple. We want to reach readers everywhere. So far, we're in 46 states and counting through programs like NBF Presents, where we partner with libraries, colleges, and presenting houses to bring authors around the country to talk about their work and engage with readers in rural, suburban, and urban settings, communities big and small, and book-rich environments, where we've distributed over 1.7 million donated books to children and families in 50 public housing communities all across the country. If you're able to help support this work, please visit our website at nationalbook.org slash donate. We believe deeply in the power of books and the power of community, and tonight's program is a special reminder of both of those things. These 25 books explore different geographies, characters, and histories in deep and vulnerable ways, and they all explore the complexities of being human, and of searching for meaning and connection. Thank you to these authors and translators and the many, many people who help make these books possible. Your words have so enriched our lives and we know will continue to enrich the lives of readers everywhere. Tonight is a Herculean task. We have 32 readers to listen to and learn from for three minutes each, three minutes. <laughs> We are also lucky to be joined by McNally Jackson Books tonight, who are selling all 25 titles right outside these doors. So if you haven't already, please buy yourself at least one copy of each book at the intermission or after the event. And now I'll turn things over to our fantastic host for the evening, Sericia J. Fennell. Sericia is a Brooklyn-born, black, Honduran-American writer, publicist, and social entrepreneur. She is the author and editor of the YA nonfiction anthology, Wild Tongues Can't Be Tamed, 15 Voices from the Latinx Diaspora, which is also available for purchase tonight. She's also the founder and CEO of The Bronx is Reading and executive director of The Bronx Book Festival. Simply put, Sericia is busy championing books and readers 24-7, and we're so lucky to have us here with us this evening. Sericia, take it away, and I hope all of you enjoy the program. <laughs> wow. I am from the Bronx, so you're... We outside tonight, give yourselves a round of applause. As Ruth said, my name is Sericia J. Fennell, and I am a black Honduran, and I'm sure a Honduran probably hasn't graced this stage, so can we get another round of applause? In addition to all of the wonderful things that Ruth already said about me, I am also the board chair of Latinx in Publishing and the creator of Honduran Garifuna Writers. So I just wanna give a special shout out to all of the writers tonight. Um, I know we are celebrating you, but I also wanna recognize that you were most likely writing your work alone in a room. Um, it was probably written during the pandemic. Uh, so you were probably dealing with more added emotional trauma. So can you please give yourself a round of applause as well. And I want to quickly remind everyone that we are here to be in community and listen to these wonderful writers. So can you please take a moment to silence your cell phones? Um, please do that. We don't want to be interrupting these wonderful writers while they're reading. I know that uh, flash photography is probably another thing that you maybe want to turn off on your phone if you plan to take pictures. So can you take a second to do that as well? I am so excited to be your host tonight. Uh, for the 73rd National Book Awards finalist reading. It's been a wild couple of years, so I know we are all excited to be in community and gathered in celebration of these writers tonight, who are super talented, by the way. 
Uh, before I explain how uh, the night will run, I just want to remind everyone that their books are for sale. And uh, even though there's not an official signing, I think that most of these writers would be OK with signing a book or two. So as Ruth instructed earlier, make sure you buy yourself a copy of each writer's book tonight. There will be four groups of readers by category with at least one pair of translated literature finalists starting and or concluding each group. For the translated literature category, one reader reads a passage in the original language. Tonight we'll hear French, Japanese, Norwegian, and Spanish. The other reader will then read the same passage in English. Each finalist will come to the stage one at a time and will read for no longer than three minutes. Three minutes, y'all. Friendly reminder again to put your phones on silent. And now I'll ask that all finalists stand and face the audience for a round of applause. So we're going to get started with group one, which will be young people's literature. Super excited. Uh, for group one, we have Kelly Barnhill, Sonora Reyes, Tommy Smith, Derek Barnes, Duwad Anyabule, Saba Tahir, Lisa Yi, Jan Fossa, Damien Searles. Let's give a round of applause. Hello. Very exciting. Uh, this is from the Ogress and the Orphans. <clears throat> People recalled the arrival of the mayor, like it was something out of a storybook. They remembered the click of his fine boots as he sauntered across the cobblestones and the sweep of his great coat and the audacious twinkling of his eyes. Each time he spoke, he thrilled them to their bones. He set up a booth during market day with a sign that said, world famous dragon hunter. Inquiries and adulation accepted. Well, remarked the butcher and the blacksmith and the tailor, world famous, you say? Huh. Well, I am certainly convinced. What a lucky town, exclaimed the cobbler and the apothecary and the constable, to host so noble a guest. What a lucky town, indeed. They couldn't rest their eyes away from the world famous dragon hunter he, he dazzled their gaze. They shivered each time he spoke. By sheer serendipity, several dragon sightings <laughs> were reported in the weeks just following his arrival, and they continued month after month. What a lucky coincidence to have a world-famous dragon hunter in their very midst at the very time when an unknown number of dragons became lurking, began lurking in the woods nearby. Each time they saw the dragon hunter emerge victorious from the woods, the dragon once again driven away and nowhere to be seen, the townspeople erupted in cheers. They elected him mayor. They re-elected him every year, a landslide every time. After a while, though, the dragon sightings dwindled and then became haphazard and eventually mostly ceased. No doubt the dragon hunter's reputation had frightened them off. And while the townspeople prided themselves on the mayor's beauty and charisma and bravery, and while they still loved to say to the town's visitors, he defeated a dragon, you know, he defeated so many dragons. Over time, his shine began to dull just a bit until their library burned and then the school 
and then building after building after building until the trees died and the shade vanished and that sinkhole took the park. How they looked to their mayor then. How they needed him then. Their world had become quite quickly chaotic and dangerous and mean. Their mayor seemed to have all the answers. I can fix it, he promised. I alone can fix it. They pressed their hands to their hearts when they heard him speak, emotion swelling in their chests. Their eyes became wide and their smiles became stiff and their faces turned to their mayor in a state of adulation and static joy. Indeed, one could say that the fire in the library was the very best thing, the very best thing that had ever happened to the mayor. A lucky coincidence, even. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sonora Reyes. I'm reading a passage from the Lesbiana's Guide to Catholic School. From chapter 17, remember the ancestors, keep them holy. We get to the festival and Bo's parents are two of only a handful of white people. And for once, it's not my turn to be uncomfortable. I'm with my people now. It's not that I want them to be uncomfortable. Actually, I really don't want them to be uncomfortable. I'm just really sick of being the one to shoulder the uncomfortability of every situation so other people can feel like everything is normal. This is my normal. Everyone is smiling right now and I can breathe. It's not like I need their approval, but it's nice to see Bo and her parents enjoying themselves. After everything they've done for me, I wanna give something back. I want them to fall in love with the colors and the music and the clothes and the dancing the way I did when I was little. I used to do baile folklorico. My mom signed me up when I was young and I still regret quitting to this day. I don't think I was any good at it, but I was five, so no one was. I always felt so beautiful tapping my feet and swinging my skirt around my waist. That was how I learned to stand straight and smile and look presentable, which ironically is why some people used to tell me I act white. But the people who taught me to dance are the same people who taught me about the cultures of our indigenous ancestors. I know a lot of Baile Folklorico came out of a mixture of Spanish and, indigen and indigenous cultures and dances, and I'm fully aware that standing up straight and smiling were probably more from the Spanish side. But Baile Folklorico isn't all about the posture and the smiles. It's about the music, the colors, the dance. It's a dance of Mexican pride, my people, my heart. I may not know the languages of my ancestors. I may not know much about them at all. Colonization will do that to a people. But when I'm watching my people dance, when I see my own skin on the stage, there's something about the joy on their faces and in their bodies that feels ancient somehow and I feel like my ancestors have been with me all along. I can almost see them here dancing with us. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> I'm Dawood Anyabwile, um, and I'm representing for Victory Stand graphic novel, graphic memoir. Um, we're all sharing a 
one passage. So forgive me, I don't have my glasses, so I have to use the backlight from my phone. Okay. okay. I raised my hands to the sky as I crossed the finish line. 19.83 seconds, another world record. At the age of 24, I became the first man to run the 200 meter race in under 30 seconds. Peter Norman took second place, the silver medal, and my teammate John Carlos took the bronze. John draped an arm across my shoulders. We, we congratulated each other like brothers, but we knew that the time had come. Nothing was planned specifically. We had brief talks. We decided that we would follow each other's lead and at the same time express ourselves the way we wanted to as individuals. I guess you could call it planned spontaneity. When the time came, we would know what to do. We both took off our pumas to expose our black socks, which represented the impoverished children and families around the world and in every major city and crowded ghetto in America. John unzipped his jacket, which went against Olympic rules to represent the hardworking blue collar folks in America who struggled to make ends meet. He also wore a beaded necklace and I wore a black scarf with those two items, we were representing the innumerable black men in America who had been lynched. Our wives had bought a pair of black leather gloves earlier in the day. It was time. First, there was silence. And then the United States national anthem began to blare across the stadium over our heads, over the stands. John and I shared the pair of black leather gloves he wore the left and I had on the right. I clenched that fist with the black gloves so tight I could feel my knuckles pop and the tips of my nails pierce my palm. I held it up like a torch, defiant. There was no way I would place my hand over my heart and give honor to a flag for a country that did not honor me or people who looked like me. Under 20 seconds. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> I could hear the wind whip around my forearm. My eyes were closed as the anthem played, and things went on in the background of my mind. I bowed my head again. I talked to God. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. 80 seconds, people. 80 seconds. That's how long we stood there as the anthem played. Those fists in the air were dedicated to everyone at home back in the projects of Chicago, Oakland, and Detroit, to everyone in the boroughs of Queens and Brooklyn, to all of the brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers in Birmingham, Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, St. Louis, New Orleans, to everyone struggling, working their fingers to the bone on farms across this country called America, to everyone holding out hope that things will get better. That was for you, from John and me. We had to be seen because we were not being heard. No hate intended.
Hello, I am reading from <clears throat> All My Rage. Um, this is a story. Um, this chapter is from a story my mother told me. October, then. From the kitchen window, the rain blurred the motel. The screaming fluorescent lights seemed quieter. The brassy room numbers became small orange fish mid-swim. The rain was clean and sweet. It brought the smell of parched earth rising and drinking and dancing. I smelled the hope, the possibility. Also, potato pakoras, stuffed with skinny green chilies and fresh from the fryer. Pakoras and green chutney were made for the rain. I popped one in my mouth just as the bell rang. The sound was a screech, but I was used to it. It reminded me of a monkey one of my uncles kept as a pet, displaying his displeasure to anyone who didn't feed him swiftly enough. I unlocked the office door, grunting as I yanked it open. A small figure waited in the downpour, an even smaller one strapped across her chest, her pale, thin hair clumped on her head like sad, dead birds. A silver heart nestled at the hollow of her throat, a tiny red stone at the center of it. I'm sorry, she whispered, to bother you late. She wiped her nose and eyes on her baby's blanket. I hope you don't have kids. Not yet, I said. I need your help. I got this sick baby and $11 to my name. I don't got credit cards or ID because my wallet got stolen. Please, ma'am. My husband died and I'm living with his mama. She threw me out and the shelter is closed and your child's grandmother threw you out? The woman nodded. And I thought of my own grandmother, Buddy Dadi, gnarled and smelling of garlic and pomegranate the large, soft belly I would ram my head into. She raised a dozen grandchildren, all my many cousins. She changed nappies, calmed tantrums, even climbed trees. Grandmothers who threw their grandchildren out. What a strange country America was. I considered the woman. You chose to kick at that moment, Salahuddin. Amma, you seem to say, help her. Even then, you were trusting. I gave her the room we'd just renovated. We'd taken out the sagging bed and the ripped furniture and replaced them with a comfortable mattress and freshly upholstered orange chairs. Tufik fixed the broken TV. I found a yellowing National Geographic about Yosemite and framed the pictures from it to hang above the bed. The door was newly painted. It was a room I was proud of. Here, our keys were old fashioned, brass with oval number tags, but I thought they were charming. Room one, to the right. The woman looked up at me and her eyes filled. I patted her shoulder and she flinched. Sorry, the woman looked down. I'm sorry. That night, beside my sleeping husband, I prayed. I prayed that the woman's baby felt better and that she slept well and that she wasn't up all night. Hi, I'm Lisa Yi, and I'm reading from Maisie Chan's Last Chance. Opa, I'm so sad that the lucky stories are over. His voice is shaky. Over? Who said anything about it being over? Lucky coming to America and building the Golden Palace was just the beginning. Your great-great-grandfather knew how to love Last Chance in a way that few had. He didn't see it as a dusty little town in the middle of nowhere. Lucky saw promise in the future. The doctor has been to the house twice this week, and it's only Wednesday. When I tell my grandfather about my paper son's research, he's thrilled. I thought I'd be done by now, I apologize, but it's taking so long. Opa motions me closer. I have to listen hard to hear what he's saying. Of course it's taking a long time. You're looking back at several lifetimes. Gather the stories. Don't lose sight of what Lucky and the paper sons have in common. I nod, the golden palace and last chance. My grandfather struggles to speak. You, Maisie, you're the connection. They all have you in common. The next day, as I near the house, I see a crowd. An ambulance is in the driveway with the red lights blinking. Opa, is Opa okay, I shout as I run toward them. Oma looks at me. She opens her mouth, but no sound comes out. Mom gathers me in her arms. Unless you count when I was born, I've never been to a hospital before. The lights are bright and the, broom, the room smells like a bad imitation of the woods. Mom and Oma hold hands as sorrow wraps them closer together. Opa's hospital bed is way fancier here than the one at home. 
The food here is terrible. Opa's voice is less than a whisper. Each word is an effort. If it doesn't kill you, nothing will. I fake a laugh, but every part of me hurts. I put on my poker face and hope that no one can see past it. Opa, you have to get well. Otherwise, who will tell the stories about Lucky and the Golden Palace? Before he can respond, a nurse opens the door. Visiting hours are over. Mom helps Alma out of the room. I'm in the hallway when something tells me to turn around. Opa struggles to sit up. He looks so weak, but I see a familiar spark in his eyes. Maisie, I'm betting on you to tell our stories, I hear him say. Then the door closes. Friends and neighbors bring condolences that go unheard and casseroles that go untouched. My grandmother has not been to the Golden Palace since Opa passed away. My mother doesn't stop crying even though she's run out of tears. I haven't cried at all. The only time I take off my poker face is when I'm alone. But even then, I don't cry. There must be something wrong with me. Thank you. My name is Jun Fosse, and I'm going to read a very short passage uh, from a new name. The title in Norwegian is Et Nit Nam. And then Damien is going to read uh, some longer passage. Och så hör jag Brage Jöj. Vi må inte glömma hunden, säger Åsleik. Ja, Brage, säger han. Det hade varit illa, säger jag. Och igår och öppna bakdörren till bilen och Brage hoppar ut så är smäller att dörra och så går vi bort till kyrken och Brage fyller rätta mig och han ser rädd mot kyrken och så lyfter jag han upp och räcker han till Åsleik och Brage pip och klinker och pip och Åsleik tar emot och sätter han ner på dörken Och Brage lägger sig rätt ner och så ligger han där och själv och ser den där rädda hundägo sina upp emot mig. Det där ser ut till att vara en dålig kipparhund, säger jag också. I'm Damien Searles. We're starting off the translated literature scattered category. And uh, this is from a new name. <clears throat> then I hear Bragi bark. Mustn't forget the dog, Oslake says. Yes, Bragi, he says. That would have been bad, I say. And I go open the back door of the car, and Bragi hops out. And I slam the door shut, and then I go over to the boat. And Bragi follows me, and he looks scared of the boat. And then I pick him up and hand him to Oslake. And Bragi whines and whimpers and whines. And Oslake takes him and puts him down on the deck. And Bragi lies right down. And then he's lying there, shivering and looking up at me with his scared dog's eyes. Doesn't look like much of a ship dog, Oslake says. He's lying there shivering and whimpering so low you almost can't hear him, he says. And I untie the front mooring, and I throw the rope to Oslake, and he coils it up nicely, and then he lifts up the front fender, and right away, the bow starts to drift away from the dock. And Oslake says, we're lucky we have the current with us. The trip up Signa Fjord goes much quicker with the current than against it. It can take almost twice as long if it's running against you, Oslake says. And I untie the rear mooring, and I coil the rope as I walk towards the boat, and I hold tight to the rope so that the stern of the boat is right up next to the dock, and Oslake holds the boat close to the dock too with a boat hook, and then I step down onto the gunwale and then down onto the deck, and Oslake shoves off with the boat hook, and right away the boat moves out into the water, and already we're a few feet from land and Oslake brings the stern fender on board and then he goes into the wheelhouse and turns the wheel 
so that the bow is pointing straight up Signa Fjord. Wow, how are you guys feeling? Are you feeling the vibes? So nice to listen to writers read their stories in person. I miss author events. I don't know about you, but I, I've really missed that. Um, so let's give another round of applause to all of those readers. <laughs> Young people's literature. Next step is the poetry category. We have Nicholas Elliott on behalf of Scholastique Mukasanga and Mark Polizzati. We have Allison Adele Hedge Coke, John Keen, Sharon Olds, Roger Reeves, Jenny Shia Ai, Idra Nove, on behalf of Monica Ojeda and Sarah Booker. Let's give them a round of applause. Hello, it's my honor to be reading on behalf of Scholastique Mukasonga. I'm reading in French from Kibogo et Monte au Ciel, and then Marc Palazzotti will read from his translate, translation, which is called Kibogo. Kamanzi, notre sous-chef, est venu pour prendre nos enfants. Le colon l'avait payé pour ça. Il lui avait donné une montre, des lunettes, une bouteille de Porto, deux touques pleines de pétrole, un coupon de tissu pour sa femme et ses filles. Il a pris les enfants de Gahutu, de Kagabo, de Nahimana et de beaucoup d'autres. Et même des petits qui n'avaient pas dix ans. Il les a amenés dans le champ du colon. C'était pour cueillir les fleurs qu'avait plantées le colon. Des fleurs avec des pétales blancs et un cœur tout jaune. Le sous-chef avait dit « Les fleurs, c'est pour la guerre. Nous autres, les Rwandais, on nous a dit « on doit faire des efforts pour la guerre, la guerre des Belges, la guerre des Anglais, la guerre des Allemands, la guerre de tous les Blancs. Ces fleurs, c'est des médicaments pour les soldats qui font la guerre. Ça tue les moustiques qui les attaquent, qui donnent la malaria. Il faut beaucoup de fleurs. L'administrateur l'a dit au chef, le chef me l'a dit, c'est pour ça qu'il nous faut vos enfants. Les petites mains des enfants, a dit le colon blanc, c'est ce qu'il faut pour cueillir les petites fleurs. Et les enfants cueillaient, cueillaient les fleurs sous le soleil, sous la pluie. Ceux qui allaient à l'école n'allaient plus à l'école. On les emmenait avant que le soleil se lève et ils revenaient à la maison la nuit tombée. Ils étaient épuisés, ils n'avaient même plus la force de manger et ils pleuraient et ils pleuraient et ils tombaient malades et quand les mères ont caché les enfants, on est venu chercher leur père et ils ont reçu Ibi Boko, huit coups de fouet. Good evening. Nicholas, thank you. This is from Kibogo. <clears throat> Kamanzi, our sub-chief, came to take away our children. The colonial had paid him to do it. He'd given him a watch, a pair of sunglasses, a bottle of port wine, two jerry cans of gasoline, a swath of fabric for his wife and daughters. He took Kahutu's children, and Kagabo's, and Ahimana's, and many others. Even the ones who weren't ten yet. He brought them to the colonial's field, so they could pick the flowers the colonial had planted. Flowers with white petals and bright yellow hearts. The sub-chief had said, These flowers are for the war. They've told us, Rwandans, that we have to help with the war effort. The Belgian war, the English war, the German war, the war of all the white men. These flowers are medicine for the soldiers fighting the war. 
They kill off the mosquitoes that attack them and give them malaria. We need many flowers. The administrator said so to the chief, and the chief said so to me. That's why I need your children. We need children's small hands, the white colonial said, to harvest small flowers. And the children harvested and harvested the flowers, in the sun and in the rain. The ones who went to school no longer went to school. They were picked up before sunrise and returned home after nightfall. They were too exhausted to eat. And they cried and cried, and they became ill. And when the mothers tried to hide their children, they came for the fathers, who got ibiboku, eight lashes. The chiefs were afraid of their white masters, and their masters had told them, now we're at war. We need men to dig the earth in the mines. We need a lot of iron and a lot of copper for our blacksmiths to make rifles and cannons. It's up to Rwanda to feed them. And we need a lot of beans for the men who dig the earth in the mines. More men and still more beans. That's how the chiefs turned harsh. And the sub-chiefs took the men and beans and took away our children. Thank you. Look at this blue, Xerxes blue butterfly from the sand dunes of San Francisco, the first known American butterfly to become extinct due to humans, first known. It's all going to burn, said the man accused of setting the holy fire, first the puma and Santa Paula palm branch, then coyotes, fox, rabbits appear, birds overcome sky, plume, then the entire yard, a carpet of undulating fleas, so thick wrapping bread bags over our feet and ankles, barely made it passable. Everything escaping heat from fire-stormed arson, 120,000 acres, blanket fire, Los Pares National Forest, and more, choking like the child they found still hung. Sleep in the dream of bettering world. Sleep in the dream, nightmare awoken. What we carry howls, boggling. Her cheek contorts in flame unfanned yet fanning. She eclipses all asunder, all broken. Scarface vision and temporal melt somewhere on my left face. You can still see where it was sewn back on. On the right, the line across the eyelid where it was sewn back on. On the abdomen, the line where it was sewn back, sewn back. Sewn back and somewhere on my right hand, where it was sewn, all the here's and there were sewn, all the labia biopsies, removals, explorations, assaults, sewn. What we carry weeps wet haired. Her cheek contorts when sprayed by guard, and from the first time she attempted, her neck ached. Meanwhile, here, a third body is found in the Baldwin Hills fire. More are missing. Arson again. Someone is out there. Remember along the way. The murdered sow bear, her clubs were taken for cause, claws, were all just symptoms of something massive, faster, over. They're killing us, weaponizing nature, sanctifying arms, consecrating each trigger flexed hand. Trigger turned to my face, every right to bear bitter, every night scheme, daybreak flash. There was no need to fictionalize this dude. He is what he is, what man made. What man? Sly Slavia Squamous, first time somewhere mid-twenties, missing children, women taken somewhere. For me, it was a gully, a pond, a base, a van, a hall, a window. Beautiful boy, made to eat cat feces, vomit, pepper sprayed, made to live in a box, bound and gagged at night because you might be gay. Beautiful child, taken at 10, beaten, tortured, malnourished, whose father, mother, tore into, pummeled for coming out, for coming out. Mutant blue-eyed coyotes, a chance mutation. Baby blues and nine coyotes suggest proliferation. Silvery, brown-backed, with icy blue eyes. Mercy, mercy, whoa, mercy, perforating his heart, lung, and liver. The Los Angeles County coroner said he was shot twice. Whoa, mercy. And the bus on the way to retraining for field workers. 
We left Santa Paula for Deventura daily. Past rhododendron, eucalyptus, limonadia, orange groves, peppers, flowers for Burpee Seed Company, red wing hawks, every mile of eucalyptus on watch like us for movement. X, Santa Paula, the North Star of Guanajuato, the Mupu of Shumash, we escaped here, refugees. This poem is called Words. Words. When you said people, did you mean punish? When you said friend, did you mean fraud? When you said thought, did you mean terror? When you said connection, did you mean con? When you said God, did you mean greed? When you said faith, did you mean fanatic? When you said hope, did you mean hype? When you said unity, did you mean enmity? When you said freedom, did you mean forfeit? When you said law, did you mean lie? When you said truth, did you mean treason? When you said feeling, did you mean fool? When you said together, did you mean token? When you said desire, did you mean desert? When you said sex, did you mean savagery? When you said need, did you mean naught? When you said blood, did you mean bought? When you said heart, did you mean hard? When you said head, did you mean hide? When you said health, did you mean hurt? When you said love, did you mean loss? When you said fate, did you mean fight? When you said destiny, did you mean destiny? When you said honor, did you mean hunger? When you said bread, did you mean broke? When you said feast, did you mean fast? When you said first, did you mean forgotten? When you said last, did you mean least? When you said woman, did you mean wither? When you said man, did you mean master? When you said mother, did you mean smother? When you said father, did you mean fatal? When you said sister, did you mean surrender? When you said brother, did you mean brutal? When you said fellow, did you mean follow? When you said couple, did you mean capital? When you said family, did you mean failure? When you said mankind, did you mean market? When you said society, did you mean sickness? When you said democracy, did you mean indignity? When you said equality, did you mean empty? When you said politics, did you mean power? When you said left, did you mean lost? When you said right, when you, did you mean right, might? When you said republic, did you mean rich? When you said wealthy, did you mean wall? When you said poor, did you mean prison? When you said justice, did you mean just us? When you said immigrant, did you mean enemy? When you said refugee, did you mean refusal? When you said earth, did you mean ownership? When you said soil, did you mean oil? When you said community, did you mean conflict? When you said safety, did you mean suspicion? When you said security, did you mean sabotage? When you said army, did you, army, did you mean Armageddon? When you said white, did you mean welcome? When you said black, did you mean back? When you said yellow, did you mean yield? When you said brown, did you mean down? When you said we, did you mean war? When you said you, did you mean useless? When you said she, did you mean suffer? When you said he, did you mean horror? When you said they, did you mean threat? When you said I, did you mean island? When you said tribe, did you mean trouble? When you said name, did you mean nobody? When you said news, did you mean nonsense? When you said media, did you mean mi miasma? When you said success, did you mean sucker? When you said fame, did you mean gain? When you said ideal, did you mean idol? When you said yesterday, did you mean travesty? When you said today, did you mean doomsday? When you said tomorrow, did you mean never? When you said hear, did you mean hush? When you said listen, did you mean limit? When you said write, did you mean wound? When you said read, did you mean retreat? When you said literacy, did you mean apathy? When you said fiction, did you mean forget? When you said poetry, did you mean passivity? When you say art, do you mean act? Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. <laughs> when I woke up this morning, I was afraid, as I am most mornings when I wake up. And then I thought, no, what we're doing tonight is preparing each one of us for action, for the good that we are um, that it has to do with the fighting for the honor of 
learning to read and write and practicing and encouraging others to practice, making it more possible to read what we want to read and to write what we can write. And then I wasn't afraid. And I'm very honored to be here with my beloved colleagues tonight. And I just thought that before I read my poem, I would show that I rewrote it a little <laughs> since it was in my book because I read it at a reading and there was something wrong with it, something <laughs> in the beginning especially, and I, fi I think I fixed it. And <laughs> later I found that I had taken out four adjectives. These were adjectives of adulational description of kind of luxurious things. And I also took out an adverb and I changed a noun, so <laughs> I'm very, um, ha I'm, I'm not afraid. I'm going to read this poem called <laughs> This poem called Quarantine. Many of the poems in this book were written during two years when I was alone in a house in the woods with the spirit company of many beloved friends. Quarantine. When I left the city for the house in the woods, I got to know the room where I sat on the bed all day and looked through its foot at the fireplace under the beveled mantel where the oval mirror was balanced vertical. Sometimes a brass ball cast a bent spear of sun onto the glass which bounced a fish hook onto the ceiling. Outside the window, the black oil seed silos dangled like the bars of a score, the song notes in a darting frenzy around them. Elsewhere, people sicken and die elsewhere. People starve and thirst and hide by dawn and walk by evening and perish, and their parents perish. I try to hide from knowing that. I send money, I send for a cotton dress for the hot weather, for the eating and drinking and writing, describing the luxuries of my vantage point in plenty and safety. I do not give enough, and my taxes are spent by the orange cockatoo in the white man house on bailing out bankers. Okay, spend the rest of the day sending money to the hungry. Pay back a tithe of what generations of my family stole. I am of a people of thieves and beaters of children. I was not beaten because of my race, but because I belonged to my mother, and I was a girl, and a child, and obedient, I mean sane. I never thought of saying no to her until I was a head taller than my mother. And I did not deserve to be beaten, but now I see it. I have not ever in my life been beaten outside my gender, or my family, or my color. I'd like to uh, dedicate uh, this reading uh, to my grandmother, Ellery Lewis, who is not here, but is here with us. Grendel. All lions must lean into something other than a roar. James Baldwin, for instance, singing Precious Lord. 
his voice as weary as water broken over his scalp in a storefront sanctified church's baptismal pool all those years ago when he wanted to be somebody's child and on fire in that being. Lord, I want to be somebody's child and chosen water spilling over their scalp, water taking the shape of their longing, a deer diving into evening traffic in the furrow drawn in the air over the hood of the car, power, and wanting to be something alive and open. Lord, I want to be alive and open. A glimpse of power, the shuffle of a mother's hand over a sleeping child's forehead, as if clearing the city's rust from its face, which we mostly are, a halo of rust, a glimpse of power. James Baldwin leaning into the word light, his voice jostling that single grain in his throat as if he might drop it, or oh, already has. I am calling to that grain of light, to that gap between his teeth, where the many of us fatherless sleep and bear and be whatever darkness or leaping thing we can be. In James Baldwin's mouth, my difficult beauty, my weak and worn, my future as any number of angels, which is not unlike the beast Grendel, coming out of the wild heaven into the hills and halls of the mead house at the harpist call with absolute prophecy in his breast and a desire for mercy, for a friend, an end to drifting in loneliness. And in that coming down out of the hills, out of the trees for once, bringing humans the best vision of themselves, which of course must be slaughtered. And the last poem I'll read is called uh, Children Listen. I'm only gonna be here three minutes. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, we can go forever. Children Listen. It turns out, however, I was deeply mistaken about the end of the world. The body in flames will not be the body in flames, but just a house fire ignored. The black sails of that solitary burning boat rubbing along the legs of lovers flung into a New York sky by a carousel. The lovers too sick in their love to notice a man drenched in fire on a porch or a child aflame, mistaken for a dog, mistaken for a child that did not run, that ran to tell of a bomb that did not knock before it entered in Gaza with its glad tidings of abundant joy. In Kazmiras, a god is weeping in a window, one golden hand raised above his head as if he slipped on the slick rag of the future, our human kindnesses, unremarkable as the flies rubbing their legs together while standing on a slice of cantaloupe. Children, you were never meant to be human. You must be the grass. You must grow wildly over the graves. Thank you. These two poems are titled Red Puncta and they're provoked by the tremendous photographic archive of Lee Gentian. Red Puncta. By negative space, by forgettings lining, by background, fabric where things seethe, where fugitive looks and tongue trees scrape open loose seams. In the far off, shame plants and earlobes and draws color. See how the background leaks out watery faces that haven't been rifled through, such as the man in the crowd of thousands running his tongue over the film scarring his teeth, such as the woman, 
her fatty lids betraying her drowsing. The ones farther off, their heads angled away, mouthing the unrecoverable. The background is milky fog, is solitary, is sight that is untold. Edge closer, friction from the future lies in the fold. Red puncta of the foreground, we will not speak. Look past the blotted figures, stiff line that parts glaucous air from ground's teeth. Forfeit faces, a light instead on the thin twine that screws hands together. Gelid landscape, chromatics at life's edge, those pant bottoms burnished to a peasant gray. Harbin in the deepest of winter, eight stripped trees matching eight individuals on their knees. Close the book, they disappear. Open it, and they're upright again. A stone turned over, red. Beneath it, what we must speak for, growing lather sloughed off the dead. Thank you. Hi, I'm Idra Novi. I'll be reading for Monica Ojeda, who unfortunately wasn't able to make it here tonight. Uh, Monica is Ecuadorian, and I learned Spanish one country over in Chile. So this is, you know, approximate. <clears throat> Abrió los párpados, y le entraron todas las sombras del día que se quebraba. Eran manchas voluminosas. La opacidad es el espíritu de los objetos, decía su psicoanalista que le permitieron adivinar unos muebles maltrechos y más allá un cuerpo afantasmado fregando al suelo con un trapeador para obis. Mierda, escupió sobre la manera contra la que se aplastaba el lado más feo de su cara de Twiggy Face of 1966. Mierda, y su voz sonó como la de un dibujo animado en blanco y negro un sábado por la noche. Se imaginó a sí misma donde estaba en el suelo, pero con la cara de Twiggy, que era en realidad la suya, salvo por el color pato clásico de las cejas de la modelo inglesa. Cejas pato de bañera que no se parecían en nada a la baja quemada sin depilar sobre sus ojos. Aunque no podía verse, sabía la forma exacta en la que hacía su cuerpo y la poco gracia la expresión que debía tener en ese brevísimo instante de lucidez. Aquella completa conciencia de su imagen le dio una falsa sensación de control. Pero no la tranquilizó del todo, porque lamentablemente el autoconocimiento no hacía a nadie a una Wonder Woman, que era la que ella necesitaba ser para soltarse de las cuerdas que le ataban las manos y las piernas, igual que las actrices más glamorosas en sus thrillers favoritos. Según Hollywood, el 90% de los secuestros terminan bien. Pensó sorprendida de que su mente no asumiera una actitud más seria en un momento así. Gracias. All right. And in English. She fluttered her eyes open and in rushed all the shadows of the breaking day. Those voluminous stains opacity is the spirit of objects, her therapist said, allowed her to make out some battered furniture and farther away, a phantomized body scrubbing the floor with a hobbit mop. Shit, she spat onto the wood floor against which the uglier side of her 1966 twiggy face was pressed. Shit, and her voice sounded like one from a black and white Saturday night cartoon. She pictured herself on the floor, but with Twiggy's face which was actually hers, except for the English model's classic duck-colored eyebrows, rubber ducky eyebrows that didn't look anything like the unplucked burnt straw above her own eyes. Even though she couldn't see herself, she knew the exact shape her body was lying in and the hardly graceful expression that must have been on her face in that brief moment of lucidity. That complete consciousness of her image gave her a false sense of control, but it didn't entirely calm her because unfortunately, Self-awareness doesn't make anyone Wonder Woman, whom she needed to be in order to free herself from the ropes that bound her hands and legs. 
just like the most glamorous actresses in her favorite Hollywood thrillers. According to Hollywood, 90% of kidnappings have a happy ending, she thought, surprised that her mind hadn't assumed a more serious attitude in such a moment. Thank you. I mean, simply amazing. Um, I love James Baldwin too, so I want to read a quote from him really quickly. When you're writing, you're trying to find out that, find out something which you don't know. The whole language of writing for me is finding out what you don't want to know, what you don't want to find out, but something forces you anyway. So thank you to all of the wonderful readers tonight. Um, I also want to take a moment, because I work in book publishing, to say thank you to the wonderful editors. I know, uh, uh, Sharon, when you were mentioning revising your poem, your uh, editor probably was like, all right. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> so thank you to the editors, the marketers, the publicists, the salespeople, and please let's give another wonderful round of applause for these two groups that just read for us. And now you're gonna have a moment to stretch your legs as you walk out the door to visit our bookseller partner, McNally Jackson, to purchase some books tonight. So we'll be back in 10 minutes. Did y'all get to purchase some books? I saw a wonderful line out there. Shout out to McNally Jackson again for working it. All right, and now for some nonfiction. Ooh. All right, do a little shimmy. I love nonfiction. Uh, so I'm going to be introducing the next group. It's going to be nonfiction, and then after that, our fiction group will close out the night for us. So for this group, we have. Samantha Schwablin, uh, Megan McDowell, Megan O'Rourke, David Quammen, Ingrid Rojas Cantreras, Robert Samuels, Tulu Olunepa. Did I say that right? Can I get a snap? No? All right, I'm going to try that again. Tolu, is that right? Tolu. Tolu. All right. Ooh. Olurunipa. Thank you, because I hate when people get my name wrong. Cerecia, a lot of vowels, but people actually pronounce it wrong a lot, so I want to do you justice. Imani Perry, and then Imani Perry on behalf of Gail Jones. Let's give a round of applause. Hi, good evening. I'm sorry we are not non-fiction. We are the strange people of <laughs> the <laughs> literature in translation that appears every second time. <laughs> and I'm going to read in Spanish just the beginning of a short story. We needed some short stories here uh, called La Respiración Cavernaria. La lista era parte de un plan. Lola sospechaba que su vida había sido demasiado larga, tan simple y liviana que ahora carecía del peso suficiente para desaparecer. Había concluido, al analizar la experiencia de algunos conocidos, que incluso en la vejez, la muerte necesitaba de un golpe final, un empujón emocional o físico, y ella no podía darle a su cuerpo nada de eso. Quería morirse, pero todas las mañanas, inevitablemente, volvía a despertarse. Lo que sí podía hacer, en cambio, era organizar todo en esa dirección, aminorar su propia vida, reducir su espacio hasta eliminarlo por completo. De eso se trataba la lista, de eso y de mantenerse focalizada en lo importante. Recurría a ella cuando se dispersaba, cuando algo la alteraba o la distraía y olvidaba qué era lo que estaba haciendo. Era una lista breve. Clasificarlo todo, donar lo imprescindible, 
lo prescindible. Embalar lo importante, concentrarse en la muerte. Si él se entromete, ignorarlo. La lista le ayudaba a lidiar con su cabeza, pero para el estado deplorable de su cuerpo no había encontrado ninguna solución. Breath from the depths. The list was part of a plan. Lola suspected that her life had been too long, so simple and light that now it lacked the weight needed to disappear. After studying the experiences of some acquaintances, she had concluded that even in old age, death needed a final push, an emotional nudge or a physical one. And she couldn't give that to her body. She wanted to die, but every morning, inevitably, she woke up again. What she could do, on the other hand, was arrange everything in that direction, attenuate her own life, reduce its space until she eliminated it completely. That's what the list was about, that and remaining focused on what was important. She turned to it when her attention wandered, when something upset or distracted her and she forgot what it was she was doing. It was a short list. Classify everything. Donate what is expendable. Wrap up what is important. Concentrate on death. If he meddles, ignore him. The list helped her deal with her head, but she'd found no solution for the deplorable state of her body. She could no longer bear more than five minutes on her feet, and it wasn't just the problems with her spine she was struggling with. Sometimes her breathing changed and she needed to take in more air than normal. When that happened, she e inhaled as much as she could, then exhaled with a rough, deep sound, so strange that she could never quite comprehend that it came from her. If she walked in the dark at night, from the bed to the bathroom and the bathroom to the bed, the sound was like an ancient being breathing on her neck. It was born in the depths of her lungs and came from an inexorable physical need. To mask it, Lola added a nostalgic whistle to the exhalation, a melody somewhere between bitter and resigned that had been taking root within her little by little. The list is what's important, she told herself every time the lethargy immobilized her. She couldn't care less about all the rest. What a total joy uh, to be here. Also, I feel I have to report that this is startlingly heavy, <laughs> Won wonderfully heavy. I'm Megan O'Rourke. I'm reading from The Invisible Kingdom, Reimagining Chronic Illness, and I would like to dedicate this reading to those who are sick and looking for answers. One of the hardest things about being ill with a poorly understood disease is that most people find what you're going through incomprehensible if they even believe you are going through it. In your loneliness, your preoccupation with an enduring new reality, you want to be understood in a way that you can't be. Pain is always new to the sufferer, but loses its originality for those around him, the 19th century French novelist Alphonse Daudet observes in his book, In the Land of Pain. Everyone will get used to it, except me. Worrying that your symptoms are psychosomatic is part of life for many people with poorly understood illness. Although the experience of illness is not just in the head, it is also not just in the body. The person enduring such an illness faces a difficult balancing act. On the one hand, she must advocate for herself, even when doctors are indifferent or ignorant, and not be deterred when she knows something is wrong. On the other, she also must be willing to ask whether an obsessive attention to symptoms is going to lead to better health. The patient has to hold in mind two contradictory modes, in other words, insistence on the reality of the disease and resistance to her own catastrophic fears. I found it hard that fall to strike that balance. I was increasingly worried. 
After all, a terrible anxiety attends chronic illness. Over time, it becomes difficult to untangle the suffering from symptoms like pain from the suffering inflicted by the concern over the possibility of more pain and worse outcomes in the future. This does not mean that illness is in the mind. Rather, the mind, that machine for making meaning, makes endless meanings of its new state, which may themselves influence the experience. It was in this recursive hall of mirrors, trying to adjust to my body's ailments, that I lived. There is a loneliness to illness, a child's desire to be pitied and seen. But it is precisely this recognition that is elusive. How can you explain and identify your condition if no one has any grasp of what it is you suffer from and the symptoms wax and wane? How do you describe a disease that's not always there? To be sick in this way is to have the unpleasant feeling that you are impersonating yourself. When you're sick, the act of living is more act than living. Healthy people have the luxury of forgetting that their existence depends on a cascade of precise cellular interactions, not you. And so in those months, I was lonely in a way I never had been before. I could taste the solitude of the human body like brine in my mouth a taste that never left me. Thank you. This is uh, simply the first three paragraphs of Breathless. Breathless and Jean-Paul Paul Belmondo can haunt me if he sees fit. <laughs> to some people, it wasn't surprising, the advent of this pandemic, merely shocking in the way a grim inevitability can shock. Those unsurprised people were infectious disease scientists. They had for decades seen such an event coming, like a small, dark dot on the horizon of western Nebraska, rumbling toward us at indeterminable speed and with indeterminable force, like a runaway chicken truck or an 18-wheeler loaded with rolled steel. The agent of the next catastrophe, they knew, would almost certainly be a virus, not a bacterium as with bubonic plague, not some brain-eating fungus, not an elaborate protozoan of the sort that caused malaria. No, a virus, and more specifically, it would be a novel virus, meaning not new to the world, but newly recognized as infecting humans. But if new to humans, where would a novel virus emanate? Good question. Everything comes from somewhere, and new viruses in humans come from wild animals, sometimes by way of a domestic animal as intermediary. This sort of transfer from non-human host to human is known as spillover. Such viruses, including Marburg and rabies and Lassa and monkeypox, cause afflictions that are termed zoonoses, or zoonotic diseases. Most human infectious diseases are zoonotic, caused by animal origin pathogens that reach us repeatedly, Nipah virus spilling over from fruit bats in Bangladesh, or have reached us in the past, HIV, group M, the pandemic AIDS subtype, spilling over from a chimpanzee once. Some are old to us, the plague bacterium, yellow fever virus, and hatefully familiar. Some are as startlingly new and ferocious as Ebola virus, like a predatory alien in a movie. A novel virus can be devastating if we have no vaccines to deflect it, no drugs to fight it, no history of past exposures to anything similar that might give us acquired immunity. A novel virus, if luck is good for the virus and bad for us, can go through the human population like a high caliber bullet through marbled sirloin.
Hello. I'm uh, Ingrid Rojas Contreras, and I'm reading from The Man Who Could Move Clouds. At first, my grandfather's grave is so dark, I can't tell what anything is. Then, among the clumps of earth, I see his skull, then white finger bones. Everything snaps into place. The finger bones are peeking out of a graying coat sleeve, wrapping delicately around the stem of a turquoise cross. The white finger bones holding the last movement of my grandfather's body feels like something I shouldn't see, so I close my eyes. Tia Perla is standing next to me. She tells her son, Fabian, the cross they buried Nono with was bronze, and Fabian explains that it is blue now because it has oxidized. Notice all the things the cross has stained blue, Nono's chest, the coat sleeve, the earth. Mummy is quiet too, but then I hear the sound of her camera shutter. There is a long steel tray for the remains lying on the grass. The grave digger in the yellow apron lowers into the tomb and the other two stay up top receiving parts. The first things to be placed on the tray are small bones and colored ribbons but then it's earth or cloth, unidentifiable matter, and small pieces of paper which have blackened with time. The papers are requests for miracles. When a curandero dies, it is customary he carry his people's errands to the afterworld, where his powers are said to multiply. I wonder how many wishes were fulfilled. The grave digger in the yellow apron is crouching at the bottom of the tomb. He is looking at nothing, it seems, but then he sweeps aside dirt and pinches at two points. He pulls, and a coat emerges. He places his hand beneath the coat, and a matching pair of pants breach. He is lifting my grandfather from the earth. Nono is born to the air, leveled inside a coat and pants, draped over this man's arms. The man in the grave swings his arms up to the man above ground, and they transfer Nono from one pair of arms to the other because the suit is not a suit filled with bones, but to us and to them, for this brief moment, a person. The man above ground drapes the coat along the length of the tray. The pants are loose and fold underneath. Nono is headless, just a blue linen suit he wore on his wedding day, dusted in decay. Then the skull is added, and as a finishing touch, the shoes, all the ingredients of humanity on a tray. After a while, Tia Perla says, how black the skull is. It's normal, Fabian answers, it's the humidity. For the next 20 minutes, I don't know where the grave diggers go. I don't know what I am doing. Something wordless is coming to pass. My grandfather's femur is black dusted with soil and mine is still gleaming white. I am 28, as old in life as Nono is in death. We are two at the edge of the known and the unknown. His bones are a conjuring. Thank you. I'm Robert Samuels, and I'm Tolu Olorunipa. Take this over. <laughs> um, uh, our book, His Name is George Floyd, is a story about a man who simply wanted to breathe in America, but ended up touching the world. In this excerpt, we write about a part of George Floyd's story that everybody knows. And a part of his story that he hoped the world would one day know. Memorial Day. It was supposed to be a fun, freewheeling day, an afternoon barbecue, a trip to Wendy's with a friend, a rendezvous with an old flame. And yet it ended with Floyd's face on the warm asphalt on a muggy late spring evening, begging an agent of the state to believe that he wasn't a bad 
guy. He told officers he could not breathe at least 27 times, and each time he was ignored. The last conversation Floyd had was under duress with an elderly black man he did not know who told him that in this country he could not win. But what was winning exactly? One of Floyd's last aspirations was to, cre to create a place called Convict Kitchen. He had been fixated on the idea of opening a restaurant that would model its menu after prison delicacies made from commissary food. The idea came about one day as he and Courtney Ross were talking about his time in prison and some of the culinary wizardry he had perfected using the bland ingredients available in the penitentiary. Wait, how do you make pizza in prison? She had asked him. Hold on, break this down for me. Oh baby, we take the ramen, we smash it up a little bit into a crust, he'd said. Then we take the ketchup packets and get the sauce going. We cut up the sausage and put the sausage on it and then we put it all on the grate. A grate? What do you mean, like, like a heating grate? Yeah, yeah. When they stopped laughing, Floyd explained how inmates would make chocolate cake. It was a complex formula that involved separating the wafers from the icing and Oreo cookies and mashing up the ingredients before putting them back together with a level of care and precision that bordered on artistry. The product, at least to the prisoners, would rival the best pastries they had on the outside. Floyd had mused about hiring a staff of ex-felons, making it easier for people with records to get their lives back on track. They had joked that the job applications would have only one question. Have you served any time in the penitentiary? Yes or no? He had planned to cover the restaurant's walls with large black and white photos depicting life inside real prisons. There would be mental health services for ex-inmates and resources for people transitioning back to life on the outside. It was one of the many things that he wanted to do when he got his life back together. He would not get the chance. By the time paramedics arrived at the hospital, he was already a corpse. George Perry Floyd Jr., Miss Sissy's oldest son, was officially pronounced dead at 9.25 p.m. Thank you. My name is Imani Perry. This is from South to America. On January 24th, 1804, there was a ball in New Orleans to celebrate the purchase of Louisiana. There had already been numerous celebratory balls, and as with previous ones, some Spaniards came, some French Creoles too, white ones, and the Americans. Ladies' gowns were empire-waisted, peach, mango, pale blue, and green. The men's coats were embroidered elaborately. A fight broke out between two of them. Only five weeks into a shared citizenship and the Americans were already encroaching too much. Yes, there were two French songs played to each English one, but the Americans took too long to finish a turn. Unlike the French quadrilles that started eight dancers at a time, in the American set dances, each couple went one by one. Their procession dragged on past the length of the music. Someone called for another English song, and a French Creole struck the speaker. An officer grabbed the Creole. The head of the provisional government, William C. C. Claiborne, saw the conflict brew brewing. He couldn't speak French or Spanish. His words of calm were empty. Several dozen men brawled in the ballroom. Louisiana had just become part of this nation, and with that, the United States of America had doubled in size. 
but the local dancers were taking part in a, in a negotiation that had an old root. It was called in some circles the stately quadrille. As in the dance, the empires circled around each other, entering and exiting alliances, all while vying for control of land that had been conquered and claimed far away from their mother countries. New Orleans was a perfect example. It had been French, then Spanish, then French again, and now American. That night in New Orleans was three centuries after Europeans had arrived in the Americas, generations into the process of settlement and conquest, slavery and incorporation, it was still contested territory. The Africans danced quadrilles too, out of doors, in Congo Square on Sundays, and they did the kalenda, hips shimming until they touched a partners, then easing back in unison. They did the bambula in a round. The women's head ties were as bright as they could be. Some hawked kala and popcorn. Some brought word of the revolution in Haiti. They were Virginians, Bajans, Bimi, Edo, and Congo, and native Orleanians. They danced to fiddles on beat. On other days, they danced to flogs, jumping away from searing pain. The Americans, white people, stood around the perimeter and watched and learned. A flock of black skimmers might have flown over the slave pens that night or rested their callow jailbirds. How could they know their presence taunted, that the people inside wished they could fly, or that the nights they were up, bodies rubbed with beef tallow, hair painted to gleaming black, faces scrubbed, had the most terrible foreboding, sail tomorrow. Thank you. And this is from the, bird from the Bird Catcher by the great Gail Jones. He kisses my mouth. He nibbles my tongue and lips. When he gets to the crocodile skin on my back, he touches it as if it were familiar territory. You're a tender, mysterious woman, and I'm an alien in my own country. We belong to each other. Catherine would love that love talk. In Portuguese, it sounds lovely. In English, it sounds like bullshit. <laughs> Take your pick. But I can't tell Catherine about him, though, because one day I'd discover him staring down at me from some museum, this strange man, all black above the navel, all white below it, and people wondering what was, in the, what was the symbolism, what was the metaphor, and some woman saying, why, it's the country, my dear, and another, well, shouldn't he be white above and black below? I did get him to be braver, though, to go for a walk with me on the beach and even wear his bathing trunks. They don't know what manner of man I am, he whispers, or what kind of woman you are to be with such a man. In Sinadelo, in Sinanso, and I pulled the lounge beach chairs into the sun. The air was clear. I wondered if his white legs would sunburn. I rubbed Vaseline and cocoa butter onto them. This was the first time he'd been brave enough to wear swimming trunks. Of course people stared, they gawked. How could you expect them not to? In fact, I could tell nationalities by the way they looked at him. Americans were the first to gawk, to stand and gawk, and no bones about it. One American even took his picture, not up close of course, but from a safe distance, took several pictures, and then came back and took another one. The English looked once and were done with looking. The French looked, were amazed and fascinated, but pretended they weren't looking. The Swedes looked, came over, and jovially discussed the matter with us. <laughs> the Germans looked, pretended they weren't looking, and pretended furthermore that there was nothing phenomenal in the man made thus, no different from any other ordinary human being. If he had a belly made out of a tin drum, they'd have pretended he was just like them. When they went back to their hotels, though, they wrote about him in their notes and feared and worried that there was such a stranger in the world and wondered whether the genes in the lower part of his body were different from those in the upper part. 
Italians came over and shook hands. His fellow Brazilians did all of the above. Some of the Catholics crossed themselves. His favorite was the man who took pictures. He'd gone toward the man the second time he came around, but the man thought it was to do some violence and ran. But actually, it was to ask for a copy of the picture of himself. It had never occurred to him to have anyone take a picture so he could see how he looked in the world. I must be a monstrosity. Wow, wow, wow. Shout out to all of the folks who did that research. I'm sure it took you a while. Shout out to the legal team as well to fact check everything. Uh, are y'all ready for the last group? Yes, tonight has been amazing. So this next group is the fiction group, our final readers for the night. We have Tess Gunty, Jamil John Ka, Ko Chai, excuse me, Sarah Thungum Matthews, Alejandro Varela, Margaret Mitsu Twani, on behalf of Yoko Tawada and Monique Trung. Give a round of applause to these last readers. Hi, I'm Tess Gunty, and I'll be reading from the opening of my novel. On a hot night in apartment C4, Blondine Watkins exits her body. She's only 18 years old, but she's spent most of her life wishing for this to happen. The agony is sweet, as the mystics promised. It's like your soul is being stabbed with light, the mystics said, and they were right about that too. The mystics call this experience the transverberation of the heart, or the seraph's assault, but no angel appears to Blondine. There is, however, a bioluminescent man in his 50s, glowing like a firefly. He runs to her and yells. Knife, cotton, hoof, bleach, pain, fur, bliss. As Blondine exits herself, she is all of it. She is every tenant of her apartment building. She is trash and cherub, a rubber shoe on the seafloor, her father's orange jumpsuit, a brush raking through her mother's hair the first and last Zorn Automobile Factory in Vacaville, Indiana, a nucleus inside the man who robbed her body when she was 14, a pair of red glasses on the face of her favorite librarian, a radish tugged from a, a bed of dirt. She is no one. She is Katie, the Portuguese water dog, who licked her face whenever the Foster family banished them both in the snow because they were in the way. An algorithm for amplified content and a blue slushie from the gas station, the first pair of tap shoes on the feet of a, a child actress, and the man telling her to try harder. She is the smartphone that films her as she bleeds on the floorboards of her apartment, and she is the chipped nail polish on the teenager who assembled the 90th step of that phone on a green factory floor in Shenzhen, China. An American satellite, a bad word, the ring on the finger of her high school theater director, she is every cottontail rabbit grazing on the vegetation of her supposedly dying city. Ten minutes of pleasure igniting between the people who made her, the final tablet of oxycodone on her mother's tongue, the gavel that will sentence the boys to prison for what they're doing to her right now. There is no such thing as right now. She is not another young woman wounded on the floor, body slashed by men for its resources. No, she is paying attention. She is the last laugh. On that hot night in apartment C4, when Blondine Watkins exits her body, she is not everything, not exactly. She's just the opposite of nothing. I'm uh, Jamil John Kochai, and um, this is the opening from my short story, Enough. <clears throat> the 
Rangina does not know what to say to her brute of a son who will not stop shouting about pills or land or a stolen envelope of cash he meant to donate to the orphans of Logar because he's rambling now, absolutely rambling in front of her beloved daughters come all the way from Fremont to visit Rangina in this lonesome living room. Her son has decided to paint the most despicable shade of blue. Just sitting there, the poor girls watching their old mother get harangued by her only living son on the earth who is shouting, I found the torn envelope in your drawer of photos. And of course, there's no way for her to respond to all of his accusations without weeping like the child she had been once married off to a 60-year-old nomad at the precious age of 15 or 14, or who knows how old exactly, though Rangina did recall she was not too old to be playing with the dolls she fashioned out of clay from the edges of the rivers near where her youngest son would one day be murdered when her mother approached her in a coat of ash or dust or snowflakes and informed her that within the year she would be married and moved and pregnant, again and again pregnant, leading to so many little unmarked graves in the apple orchard beneath the falling blossoms, as if Allah, all praise be to him, were saying, look, I know, I know, but then there's this, until the baby stopped dying with the birth of her eldest son, the survivor, the rambler, still somehow rambling beneath the half-lit ceiling light he has failed to fix for the past three months, no matter how many times Rangina moans, this darkness will swallow me. His massive frame blocking the television and the fake fireplace and the cabinet containing Rangina's favorite photograph of Watak, his head shaved, his mustache barely sprouted, his soft lashes sparkling with frost, his lips slightly parted as if he is about to speak. Thank you. Hello there, my name is Sarah Thunga Matthews, and I'm going to be reading from my novel, All This Could Be Different, about 30 pages in, because I've been reading the opening all the time. <laughs> August turned ripe as a fruit. Sneezeweed and tansy brightened the sidewalks, and my mother called to say my uncle died. Acute pancreatitis and cirrhosis of the liver. In the last year, his eyes had turned the color of old urine his calves swelled to balloons. They were keeping the body refrigerated until every possible Amai and Achayan from Dubai to Brampton, Kolkata to Scotland, could fly back to put him in the cemetery. The timing of my uncle's croaking was notable, on the heels of our harvest feast, his funeral falling on its most auspicious day. If I had been there still, I would have taken a great and malicious pleasure in eating the sadhya as though the day held only something to celebrate. Would have shoveled red mata rice and coconut parupa and beans thorin into my mouth like a greedy little boy. Asked for seconds of sweet creamy payasam over the wails of the mourners. To my mother I said stiffly, Adesheri, sorry to hear this. My mother was crying. You are a very cold person, she said to me in our language. I had not offered to come home, to support my parents, to support her. His whole life, my uncle had bullied her. Once in a drunken tantrum, he had slapped her in front of my father, who summarily threw him into the rhododendron bushes. After that, my uncle decided that I was a more strategic target. The memories tumbled back to me, rolled into the other like socks. My uncle waiting by the elementary school's iron gate. How I would run to him, a school bag flack, flapping up and down against my thin back. To the person who paid me the most attention, who laughed at my every joke, who said he loved me. A darting creature with huge eyes, Monchine was. Wispy hurricane of hair circling the bare eye of his scalp. He would play Legos with me, then stamp on the house I had built. When, I was when he was especially jobless, he would take me on his long, ambling walks and pinch my nipple hard if I dawdled. There were other things, and I did not for a second wish to, wish to dwell on them. And here my mother was, 
weeping for this useless man. In the background, I could hear the opening music of the Kannada serial my grandfather liked to watch from the bed. Thank God I was now far away from the people who had hurt or overlooked me, the neighbors and cousins who lionized my parents when they achieved a modicum of success and visibly scorned them when it had been taken away. I would never, if I could help it, live there again. Yes, I said acidly to my mother. You are correct, very astute of you. Once the phone went quiet, I felt a wicked pang. Thinking of my parents living two oceans away with their slackening bodies, their private burdens. In silence, I wiped the kitchen counters, wrung the rag out in the sink. Thank you. Ooh, hello. I'm not nervous, you are, okay. Uh, my name is Alejandro Varela. Hi, Robin. And uh, I'm gonna read from The Town of Babylon, first novel, um, penultimate chapter, no spoilers. Actually, I'll tell you real quick something about Andres, the protagonist. He's the kind of person who would describe himself as a Marxist, but wouldn't be able to tell you what that means. Um, in part because he never wanted to know so that he wouldn't be accused of anything. <laughs> God bless America. And then in part because um, uh, it's the sort of thing he looks up in Wikipedia twice a year and never retains. So anyway, Marco was kind enough not to recriminate more, but he looked at me the way someone looks at an old dog with three legs. The odd thing was that by the time I'd met Marco, I considered myself relatively well versed in the histories of colonialism and oppression in this world. I'd already rejected, in theory, if not yet fully in practice, the white supremacist rubrics for language, culture, style, and self-worth that had defined my understanding of what it meant to be oneself in this world. But apparently, I hadn't scrubbed myself clean. After that day, Marco stopped calling and messaging with the same Elan. He wasn't rude, but neither was he interested anymore. He was kind enough to wait for me to get the hint instead of dumping me outright. That encounter stayed with me for a long time. I couldn't understand why I had held on to such archaic notions. Why had I allowed a few superficial markers to determine how I would interact with others? I'd dated white men before Marco. I'd contended with their assumptions and discomforts, and yet somehow I'd cast myself in the role of white guy. In brief, I had fallen prey to the Latinx hierarchy, a lens, really, a racist lens with tears and a color gradient. At the top, unsurprisingly, sit European Latinxes, white Tinos. Irrespective of nationality or ethnicity, this layer includes most of Buenos Aires and most of the upper castes of all Latin American countries. Diego Maradona is the sole occupant of the subsequent tier. Next are the mestizaje that lean more European than indigenous, excluding anyone with visible African diaspora ancestry. Below them are the mestizaje that lean more indigenous than European, still excluding black Latinxes of all kinds. Each of these tiers is then stratified by nationality, beginning with white Argentines who don't live in the capital, Chileans who disdain Argentines, followed by non-coastal Colombians, despite how large El Costeño, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, looms globally, the Mexican actor Cantinflas, and other South Americans. <laughs> Peruvians of Japanese descent follow. The subsequent tier is occupied by Central Americans, again stratified by genotype, but still not inclusive of black people. Below them is the trifecta, Puerto Ricans, the, Mex the Mexicans who haven't won Oscars, and Dominicans, all of whom, not coincidentally, have some of the longest, most oppressive histories with the United States. The penultimate tier includes indigenous people without African ancestry, who were labeled indios as, par as per the ignorance of 15th century imperialists. Last are all the permutations of the African diaspora, black indigenous, black Latinx, Afrodescendientes, Morenos and Pretos, Creoles and Maroons, Mijitos, Raizales, Garifunas. Countries with plurality or majority black populations like Belize, Panama, Guyana, Suriname, French Guiana, Haiti, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, and all heretofore unmentioned Caribbean nations. This tier too is subject to discrimination based on hue and shade. Cubans are their own category, 
and merit a secondary analysis. After all, the revolution continues. They somehow stood up to the empire and have thus far survived, giving them an almost magical status. In any case, no amount of post-breakup social mapping reunited Marco and me. Everybody who has come before us has made this a real hard act to follow. <laughs> um, and since Yoko is not here, I'm, I'm going to be reading in Japanese, and my friend Monique is, is going to be me and read in English. So, in English, I'm going to read in え、近くに若い女性が暮らし やぶれそうな雨で魚を捕らえてどうにか自分一人の命をつないでいるそのままでは子孫が途絶えてしまうので別種の生き物との交配の可能性を探る機能のスイッチが自動的に入る羽根づぐろえするつるの姿に色気を
thank you to the National Book Foundation, to the staff, to our bookseller partner, McNally Jackson, all of these writers' books are for sale, including mine, Wild Tongues Can't Be Tamed. I heard they have copies out there. Uh, but it's, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for giving this black Honduran from the Boogie Down Bronx a chance to host. Wow, it's been amazing. Thank you.